our steering committee for inviting me and uh, including me as, with such a great group of uh, speakers. And I'll tell you, Amanda's a tough act to follow. Um, and we, uh, at, at the group, it's our pleasure to work with Audubon on the Be A Good Egg program. In the three or four years we've been working with Audubon on that program, you can see the change happening, happening on the South, uh, in Southhold. Uh, with the different school children and the public when they start seeing the signs. And, and I echo uh, the young woman's uh, comment about the, the sterile looking government signs. And uh, I don't think they uh, deter people at all. That's my opinion. Uh, and I think the, the, the signs the kids make really do. They really have an impact. And it's, it's not only uh, impacting the next generation, but the, my generation and uh, and, and the older generation, so um, it's really a pleasure. So, my name is Aaron Verge, I'm Vice President of Group for the East End. A little sorts of background, a little bit about me. I grew up uh, in Oswego. Uh, in my late teens, I started getting into bird watching and I went up to Derby Hill. And Derby Hill is a spring hawk watch site on uh, eastern Long Island, uh, eastern uh, uh, Lake Ontario. And uh, it's where I saw my first osprey. And I didn't grow up seeing them. They just kind of migrated through. Now I go back home uh, some uh, 25 years later and they're nesting all over the place, kind of like what's going on here uh, on uh, Long Island. <coughs> A quick overview. I'm gonna talk about the life history of the osprey, reasons for the decline, recovery efforts that went into place in the last century, and some are continuing, current monitoring and the status, and ways to get involved, and some of which Amanda just touched on. First, Group for the East End, uh, we're established in 1972 as the Group to Save America's South Fork. That's the official name. Uh, it was shortened to Group for the South Fork. Um, back in the 1980s, uh, two folks that are here today, uh, Steve Biasetti and Mike Bettini were some of the first uh, groupies, if you will, of, of the Osprey, and they started putting up these um, the nest poles. This is what we kind of call the Iwo Jima style. You get about five or six people on the pole, <laughs> lift it up. You got a couple of scissor two by fours, and it, which are called cheaters. And then um, you, you pop it in the ground. You got a, one, you got a person on the, on the far left that's a spotter. And uh, that's pretty much how it goes. There's, there's many different ways to do it. Um, a lot of government agencies will actually use heavy equipment. Uh, we prefer not to do that because uh, anything uh, two inch impression into the marshland is actually a violation, DEC violation. We've since become group for the East End because we are covering the whole East End of Long Island, our, our scope of service. Uh, real quick, the osprey, dark above, white below. Um, eagle is also dark above, but they have the white head, of course, and the white tail, the mature birds. Um, they have eyes that are yellow, the black, uh, dark chocolate band going through the eye. Um, smaller than an eagle, okay? Eagles have about an eight, eight and a half foot wingspan. Uh, these guys are about six and a half to seven feet wingspan. Uh, they kind of fly like a gull, so you got to pick up some of these colorings where um, you have the, the kind of the wrists that are kind of have the spots on them, banded tail. Um, the male, males and females we call monomorphic, they look alike. Um, so right here you have an adult on the bottom left with an immature, uh, the immature also on the right. And we're also looking at the eyes when we're doing our monitoring uh, in July. There's two adults at the top. They have more of a yellow eye, or almost even like a, like a whitish yellow eye. And then the bottom, they have more of a orange, a deep orange, almost an amber. And sometimes that's all you see when you visit a nest. You'll see a little bird peeking down at you. And if you look up and you see that dark amber eye, you can check, check off that it was a, a young bird. A couple of the adaptations, we have long, strong claws, curved about one third of a circle. And that's good for gripping, gripping things like a fish. The pads are covered with spicules. Spicules are kind of like sticky barbs, uh, and they have a little bit of um, increased surface area to grab something. Outer toe is reversible, again, uh, for, for grabbing something that's kind of slimy, scales, kind of wet. It's the uh, only species in the family. So if you saw Don uh, Ripe's talk yesterday on barn owl, this is a cosmopolitan bird like the barn owl. So it's found uh, across the world, uh, worldwide distribution everywhere except Antarctica. 
They require unfrozen water bodies, because you probably guessed it, they eat fish. It's hard to fish when you, uh, it's a frozen water body. And the conservation status throughout the world is, is good. Uh, they are in a good population. They are not declining. We'll get more into that in a second. There's the distribution. <clears throat> um, not just on shorelines. They are in the interior parts of, of uh, countries. If you look at South America, throughout the Amazon uh, river basins, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. We're going to talk about migration. Uh, they are a migratory bird. Our birds in the northeast are, you can kind of call them neotropical. They're not neotropical like warblers and vireos and thrushes. They're neotropical in the sense that they go from uh, the northern latitudes to the tropical latitudes uh, in, the, in the new world, so therefore neo. Um, they, and they do it mainly because, again, they, got, they have to go where there's unfrozen water bodies in order to survive. They are loners. They migrate alone. So the first ones I saw at Derby Hill, there might have been a couple together loosely, but they don't migrate like broadwing hawks uh, or, or um, uh, golden eagles, for that matter, that migrate in groups. Uh, the distance we'll talk about, but in our case, our birds are migrating about 3,500 miles one way. So twice a year, 7,000 miles. We're talking about Norfolk Bob here. Norfolk Bob was a, was a bird that was banded with a satellite backpacking system by a guy named Rob Beergard. Rob was a professor, sci, uh, researcher down at Drexel University. He's since retired. And uh, here's uh, Norfolk Bob was banned in 2010, actually 2009. And um, the first tracking we have is in 2000. I'm sorry, he was born in 2009. The first tracking was in 2010. And he was banded on, uh, if you're familiar with the Norfolk, uh, the Norfolk Country Club, a little place called Downs Creek. And Downs Creek, uh, he had a, a bunch of uh, traps set up, and a uh, bird came down, uh, and he, he was able to uh, get it out of the trap, put the satellite tracking on. I had a picture in here, but I think I took it out. But anyways, these are the five fall migrations that Norfolk Bob did uh, in, in the course, five complete uh, migrations he, he did. Spoiler alert, he is no longer with us. On the sixth trial down in, uh, I think it was in October of 2015, he was attacked, it's believed, in the Lake District of North Central Florida by a group of bald eagles. And bald eagles, we'll get to in a second about predation and how these uh, birds aren't necessarily copacetic. Uh, a couple things to point out is this, I guess we're calling this lavender, and this orange are going over water, okay? Uh, it's the only raptor that's known to consistently fly over open water. And that's pretty impressive. Peregrine falcons once in a while will be seen doing it, but these guys, and again, when they get down here, they do a shot all the way across Cuba, and then they shoot over in the course of a single day or a day and a half, they'll go over open water until they get to the northern section of South America. Uh, this was his last uh, complete Migration south, 56 days, 56 days to go from Kutchog, New York, down to, uh, I think it's central Venezuela. So 29 days resting, 20, 27 days migrating, so kind of one day on, one day off, if you will. It was probably more like three days on and then one day off and then a couple more days migrating, but that's kind of in the simple terms. And then when he gets there, this is, this is what he did. Every year, he went to the same spot. Just like every spring, he would show up in Kutchog. Every, every uh, fall, he would show up down here. And these are some of the various points. Um, Rob, on his website, I think it's called Osprey Tracks or one of those, uh, has a lot of different um, in-depth maps you could go to and check it out. If you remember the name Rob Beergard, you'll remember just to Google that, and all this will come up. And of course, when he gets there, it looks just like Kutchog, New York, Long Island. Um, he switches completely over to um, freshwater bass for the most part and some catfish. Um, the problem when they get down there is the protection laws of osprey and birds in particular are not what we have up here. They don't have a, the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, they don't have an Endangered Species Act in Venezuela. And, and all aside from the political unrest down there, when they get down there, you have people who are hunting subsistence hunters, fishermen, and fishing for a living. And if an osprey is coming down and they keep seeing them steal fish, that's a problem. So these birds are shot down there. 
Um, there are, even though DDT, I think, is banned in Venezuela, it's still in use, and other chemicals are used that, we are, that are banned. My point here is, is there's a lot of perils for our migratory birds. So heading back north, a couple things to note. The root, these braids are nice, and they're not really braids, but they're, the roots are very tight. They keeps along the same path. And this is his last spring trip. Now notice this, 23 days, 21 migrating, and two stopovers. So they're really getting up here. The other thing I want you to see is when he started. He started March 30th. Okay, the birders in the room know March 30th. Aren't, aren't our birds usually back by St. Patrick's Day? And that's true. Uh, a lot of the males are back now. Um, and Rob is funny. He's written a little bit about, the, the, a little bit about Norfolk Bob. Norfolk Bob, they, they will t typically start breeding at the age of three or maybe four, and some will wait a little bit later. Compare that to the eagle, which really doesn't, the mature eagle won't start breeding in, in, in a minimum until five, maybe six. Norfolk Bob at this point is five, right? And he's still, there's no, there's no uh, urgency to get up north, okay? Um, who knows? You may draw your own conclusion, but by the time he gets here, it's April 20th. By April 20th, most of the males are already in place, most of the good nest sites are taken, and at that point, courtship has already begun, okay? So Norfolk Bob was an, was an, was an odd, odd osprey, if you will. Uh, fast forward to July and August of 2014, this is some of the uh, movement. This is daily movement. Um, I think this is every 12 hours, there's a ping here, so there you have you have a lot of different uh, movement going on, going out to Robbins Island on one occasion, going over into Aquabog, it looks like, but really sticking around uh, within about a five or six mile uh, radius. This is just July and August again, a little zoomed in. Um, so he was banded, uh, where was he banded? Right in this area. Well, that's Halls. He was banned over in this area. So he, he was eventually, he didn't, the, these guys have a great site fidelity. They go back to their, their place of, uh, of birth. And he was, for whatever reason, he's very close. I mean, he's, as a crow flies or as the osprey flies, he's only about a half a mile. But this is, was his predominant area. And, 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 and Biergaard uh, believes that he was actually trying to breed your, what we call playing house this last season. So jumping around now, we're going to talk about the osprey history, principally on Long Island. There were really no accurate surveys uh, before the 1930s. Uh, a lot of anecdotal um, sightings by local naturalists. We have Roy Latham, uh, Forbush in Massachusetts. Um, Plum Island in the 1800s, I'm going to read something real quick for you. Um, Plum Island, it's believed to be the densest breeding colony of, Plum, uh, of osprey ever in the world. And in Alan Poole's book, and word on the street is this is being updated. This book came out in the, like in the, in the early 90s. Um, it's really the Osprey Bible. And uh, everything you want to know about Osprey um, is pretty much in it. But here's a little passage I want to read that um, a naturalist by the name of C.S. Allen in 1892, American ornithologist and egg collector, he had visited Plum Island. Uh, on several occasions between 1879 and 1885. And this is before development. This is before Lab 257. This is before uh, um, Fort Terry. And so this is what he writes. On nearing the island, one was struck with great number of fish hawks to be seen on all sides, sailing through the air or perched on the stakes of fish ponds. The first nest shown, shown to me was in a dooryard, only about 50 yards from a house and only seven or eight feet from the ground. In the wooded part of the island, the nests were very numerous, the larger trees, trees in the interior all being occupied, while near the edge of the wood, nearly every tree had a nest, and some of them two or three each. On the north shore, where the beach is strewn with large boulders, nearly every rock, even some that were far out in the water, were occupied with a small nest. So what happens, um, the island starts to be developed, Fort Terry is, is built, and a lot of these osprey leave. Um, and you could go a couple different ways, and we've heard about this from other lecturers. You can go to Great Gull Island. That's where there's a big, there's a big uh, a turn, turnery. I don't know if that's a term or not. Um, or you could go to another larger island, actually bigger than Plum Island, and Gardner's Island. But the problem with Gardner's Island 
it was loaded with osprey already as well. And some of the history, and I'm not going to read a passage about that, but some of the history is they were nesting on fence posts and also in trees and bushes. And that colony was believed to be as many as 200 and 250 uh, pair. Uh, not as dense as Plum Island, because Plum Island is smaller. But you, you see where I'm going. It, actually, this is a picture on, Plum, on uh, Gardner's Island, the nest right on a, uh, I don't know if that's an outhouse or some type of a privy. Um, so you have basically the Plum Island population being kind of dissipated. And then you have still the turn of the last century shooting and habitat loss occurring, egg robbing, which, which was a big uh, uh, hobby, if you will. But then it's when DDT comes along, the silent killer, it's the, uh, the miracle insecticide. It was used during World War II, and uh, so much, I guess, was produced that they decided, well, let's, it kills everything. It kills mosquitoes. It kills all the bad things, I should say. It shouldn't kill everything. And uh, Rachel Carson comes along, and she says, wait a minute. Hold, hold, hold the phones. This is not, this is not uh, as great as we think it is. It's eventually banned in 1972, but before that, the people who brought you Phyllis Morris products were putting out things like DDT is good for me and, and all this stuff, uh, like I said, was produced in vast quantities. One of the uh, unsuspected results was egg thinning, egg cracking. Um, you also had uh, eggs that would, uh, the, the interior part of the egg would almost cook. So you had a lot of uh, birth uh, defects occurring. And this obviously things like the bald eagle, which we know about, but also things like the brown pelican, the cormorant, double crested, the great cormorant, okay? When I was growing up on Lake Ontario, I never saw a double crested cormorant. You know, it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I first saw a few. And in a very short time, uh, double crested cormorant, a colony on Little Galoo Island. If you know Watertown, you know, you know salmon fishing. Uh, Little Galoo Island is a uninhibited small island, rocky island, and in the course of a decade, it grew to being about 100, 120 different pairs of double crested cormorants. There was a crash in the fish population. I'm kind of going off on a tangent for a second, but it makes sense in, in, the, in the study of this osprey. The zebra mussel was uh, accidentally introduced to Lake Ontario and it er eradicated it, the, the fish column, if you, the, the, the food web in, in, the, in Lake Ontario and a lot of the Great Lakes. And uh, because of that, a lot of the sports fish at the very top didn't have smaller fish because smaller fish didn't have other smaller things to eat. So the fishermen went out and they decided it's a double crested cormorant. We can't catch fish. It's because they're eating them all. They're eating their share. They weren't decimating the population like the zebra mussel. So they decided to annihilate the whole colony. So that's what made me think later on when the osprey came along, what happens if this population gets to a point it's so big that people start blaming the osprey because they're growing and they're getting all these fish. Um, so we'll come back to that tangent in a second. More eggshells. Again, fish were affected. Salmon were affected uh, up in Lake Ontario area. Peregrine falcon, of course. And it's because of the bioaccumulation of DDT in, 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 in fat cells. Uh, very small in the water, but 10 times the increase as it goes all the way up. So all these, all these uh, birds of prey, if you will, were, were greatly impacted. And humans are as well, uh, but we have the ability to kind of eat other things. We're not eating the same thing like, like, a, like an osprey would be doing or an eagle. So a new era is born. Anyone know who these three people are? We all know the guy on the right, all right? Brooklyn, Brooklyn, uh, uh, Brookhaven National Lab Zone, Dennis Polston. I'll give, you the, I'll give you the middle guy, Art Cooley. How about the guy on the left? That's Art Cooley on the left. Art Cooley, I'm sorry, uh, yep. Uh, Charlie Worcester. Charlie Worcester, you don't, you, you shouldn't even be playing. Charlie Wooster is also often called the EDF's third tenor. Um, Art Cooley, most people know, and Dennis, of course, Pulston. Uh, these are the guys who started the uh, Environmental Defense Fund, or EDF. Whoop, there we go. Um, and they decided, you know, enough is enough. We know it's DDT. Even though Rachel Carson's book had come out uh, close to a decade earlier, um, they decided to sue the Suffolk County Mosquito Control Commission, which we know today is Vector Control. And they cited the loss of the osprey on eastern Long Island. And they cited it um, because people were going out of work. Um, you know, 
the, the fishing industry was was uh, was impacted. Um, the they by the um, um, by the loss of, of, of the birds, they were they were kind of uh, connecting the dots. That it might have been a loss of fish. Um, Environmental Defense Fund, 1967, and they in this lawsuit against Suffolk County Mosquito Control, it goes all the way up to New York Supreme Court, and it's the first time in our in the nation that legal standing to a citizens group is upheld. That's a big thing for the group because some of the things that we do, we reach to a point where we need to litigate. And as a community organization, if you will, a regional conservation group, um, it's, sometimes it's hard to get standing. But this was the first time that uh, something on this level uh, occurred, and it is during the, the environmental movement of the 1970s. That lawsuit occurs in 1971. New York State bans DDT in 1971, subsequent, subsequent to, the, to, the, to the suit. And then in 1972, uh, DDT is banned uh, nationwide. I had to put this in here. This is Del Dennis Poulston's uh, osprey. And uh, anyone want to guess the fish? If you saw Carl's talk yesterday, Menhaden, also except Bunker, of course. And the decline to recovery. Um, there were estimated about less than 1,000 breeding pairs between the I-95 corridor, if you will, along the coast. That was in the 1940s. And that's around the time that Roger Tory Peterson and his wife Barbara start noticing, how come there's birds not coming back? They lived in Old Lyme, Connecticut. How come there's birds not coming back to their, to their nest platform? Um, and then further, you have a 90% dis disappearance between 1950 and 1975. So something's going on. Um, yes, there was the, the persecution that I talked about uh, uh, because they go down to South America. Egg collecting had, had its toll earlier in the century. Uh, but the, really the culprit was, was DDT. So there is a movement to start placing, constructing poles and platforms um, really throughout the Northeast. This happens in Connecticut, uh, it happens uh, on Martha's Vineyard, uh, and again, it starts to happen on Long Island. And there was a 15% return to, to the normal levels, uh, to a point where hacking started to occur uh, in areas uh, from Long Island, there was a, a group, I think there was some uh, 38 or 39 birds were brought from Long Island up to southwest New York State. 150 nests by 1969, we talked about DDT. The, the bird was listed as endangered in 1976, downgraded to threatened in 1983. So there was a recovery, a noticeable recovery, um, you know, in a mere seven years in New York um, this is the transfer into southwest New York State. And then 230 breeding pairs on Long Island in 1995. And the DEC actually stopped their aerial census in 1998. And this brings us to uh, Chip Hamilton's talk yesterday, if you were lucky enough to see his, his turkey talk. Um, I also got a call, I think it was in 2010, I've been at the group a few months, and it was a reporter from Newsday, Newsday uh, who said, you know, what's going on with the osprey? They seem to be everywhere. Do you have a sense of how many, how big the population is? And I said, no, I don't. Have you tried Chip Hamilton at DEC? And she's like, well, he told me to call you. So um, I thought, well, this is interesting because I'm, I'm curious and having, had in, uh, I had just moved out to, to the East End and there's from Oyster Bay and there's way more osprey in the East End. And I said, you know, that's, that's a good idea. And, you know, every good idea, you know, to some of us in the nonprofit world is a grant opportunity. So uh, I went to my boss, Bob DeLuca, and he loved the idea as well. So we started shopping and around. We came up with a proposal, and every single foundation said, no, the Osprey are doing fine. Why would we fund you? Find, find an animal, animal that's not doing so well. And I thought, that's a crappy way of looking at this. And I went back to the double-crested cormorant story. So I did find a funder, um, and he decided, ironically, he has a hedge fund called Osprey Capital. Um, and he loved the idea, and uh, so he, he's, he's, he's helped our work here. Um, we, did, we did a couple things. I don't know if this is the beginning. Well, I'll leave that up there for a second. You guys see the little nest eye candy. Um, we did a couple things. I, I decided before we know what the population is, what's the point of keep, you know, to continue putting up these poles and nests? They're nesting in all these other places. This is uh, 
This is in Jamesport at a, uh, at a recreational park or a ball field. This is in Southhold uh, near Archimomac Pond. Uh, this is also near the pond. This was a private homeowner who, uh, it was a dead white pine tree, and he decided to leave it for the woodpeckers. He topped it because he didn't want it falling on his house. And the osprey said, thank you very much. We'll take over from here. And uh, some of the platform work we've done over the years, I think this is uh, Akabonic Harbor. And this is, I pulled off uh, the web. Uh, this is somewhere in, um, in Europe. And uh, it, it's, it, it's classic. Um, we have a partnership with PSENG. This was a long time coming. Um, I, prior to uh, working at the group, I worked for the Audubon Society. And we um, had a good working relationship with LIPA and later National Grid. And in the last few years, we've developed a really good relationship with PSENG. And um, I'm going to say that they've been a good partner of late. And early on, I think they had their kind of head in the sand and they thought, well, you know, of course we protect and we love wildlife. Why, you know, why would people think otherwise? And I said, well, your actions have consequences. When you knock down a nest at nighttime and the birds are squawking and the neighbors are kind of pissed off, you got to do something about it. And this is the result. This was a couple years. Uh, they actually hired a carpenter who built these boxes, did the research, knew how long the purchase should be. Um, it's, you can look at it as a Band-Aid. You can look at it as, uh, you know, accepting reality because osprey are here. Osprey will nest on high, high uh, elevated areas, telecommunication towers, um, you know, uh, telephone poles. I was in the field on Wednesday and they removed one in West Hampton uh, on a 110 foot pole uh, along a bridge. And uh, it needed to be done and they were able to relocate that nest. And so um, it, it, it's a good partnership indeed. A um, couple things about population dynamics uh, with Osprey. The annual productivity is somewhere between 0.8 and 1.3. Uh, just to, to come off of Amanda's talk, uh, anything, or anything below one, you're not, you're not uh, fulfilling, uh, the population is not growing. Um, so, the, uh, also, unlike a lot of shorebirds or unlike a lot of birds in general, it's one clutch, it's one shot. You know, if you abandon the nest, you gotta wait till next year. So that's why sometimes you have a lower productivity. I mentioned about uh, Norfolk Bob going back to his place of birth. They have a high uh, site fidelity. Uh, they often will return, not necessarily the same nest, but the same area. So for instance, uh, a bird born in Orient is probably not gonna say, hey, you know what? I mean, maybe next year I'll go up to Cape Cod. It doesn't really work that way. Um, food and nest sites uh, are very important. Um, you know, you gotta have the fish and you have to have available nest sites. Uh, we'll get to nest sites in a second because they're coming up with some interesting things uh, that they're doing now. So we're gonna switch gears for a second. I forgot how we did this, Tim. How'd we do this? Oh, there it is. We do have some predators. I, I have a red-winged blackbird here. Um, he's not really, a, not really a predator, but I thought it was a funny, funny image. Uh, I don't know why a, a red-winged blackbird would be intimidated by an osprey, maybe because of the size, but uh, it's harassing a young osprey, and the o young osprey is kind of like, geez, really? Um, some of you may have already seen this before. This is Hog Island, Maine. These are uh, young birds. First there was three and now there's one. We're gonna see it at a little bit slower time. This, this nest cam has been very popular. Um, so that is a young bird flying out. This is a bald eagle coming in. That's an adult bird behind it, adult osprey. The eagle gets one of the young. And the third young is saying, whatever that guy just said, Jesus. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
may have one more. Ironically, I don't know why we don't have the sound. Same nest. Whoop. So, predation can be diurnal, it could be nocturnal. So you have a bald eagle, adult bald eagle taking a young osprey uh, nestling, and then you had a gray horned owl uh, taking one uh, at night. So, I was doing a, a full moon hike the other night, and I've been saying the bald eagle is going to be the equalizer. It's going to you know, keep the population a little bit more in check. And this woman said, I've got to give her credit, because I don't think I could come up with it. She goes, why don't you call it the eagleizer? And I said, you know what? I'm going to use that. I'm doing a talk on Saturday. <laughs> Are you out here, by the way? She said she might be coming. No? Um, so it's true. So we're, we're keeping, a, we're keep, keeping a, a, an eye on that. If you follow nest cams, I know there's a group of people out there. They, 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 they watch a lot of different nest cams throughout the country, throughout the world. And a lot of the, and I'll, from, from time to time, check in on these nest cams. And I'll go to the comments to see what's been going on. And, and how, so that was in 2017. That was two years ago, uh, the gray horned owl. And uh, three years ago was the bald eagle. So that's back to back years. They've had a, they've had a, a tough go. Let's talk a, a little bit about um, the group's five-year study that we've been doing. We started in 2014. I say January. Obviously, the birds aren't back, but that's when we decided to, uh, to check on a lot of the polls that not only the group has put up, but the polls that we're going to monitor in general. The group, we believe, over the course of, uh, gosh, going on close to 40 years, has put up uh, around 200 polls, okay? Uh, that's uh, a lot of them on the South Fork. Some poles were, were, were needed to be fixed and put up again. Uh, on the North Fork alone, uh, we, we've put up quite a few. And obviously, when you see an osprey pole in the East End, it's not necessarily a group for the East End pole. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there doing it. Um, SOFO, Natural History Museum, has been a partner of ours. Um, East Hampton Town, obviously, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Paul DeAndre, who's I consider a mentor on getting me involved in this program. Um, and, and, and the list goes on and on. John Sepp on, on, on the North Fork as well, uh, and the Stoutenberg family. So, and then the, the survey continues right into August, early August. We're mainly surveying the month of July. Uh, this past year, we had 519 specific sites with 420 active. Um, go back to the early 2014, I think we had uh, 319 were active, so there's, a, there's an increase. Uh, and 365 has been the average the, over the five years. Occupancy rate, 72%, and 69% uh, is being the average. 479 young last year, 356 the average. You see the increase over the average. 1.59 productivity, okay? We, if we only could have that with piping plover, we'd be ecstatic, but the osprey uh, is doing quite well. 50% uh, increase over the five years, okay? That is not... Uh, that is not going to uh, uh, stay at that level. So that's why we bring up things like the eagle and uh, gray horned owl and, and other things. And we, we're going to talk about the trash in a second. And then um, one thing to point out is less than 30 um, poles, nest sites that we've monitored were, were we call damaged. That's an average over the five years, less than 30. And I bring that out because 
Um, if we see something broken, we work with our partners to try to fix it, some of which we cannot fix. But the actual poles, for the most part, we don't want uh, damaged poles out there. So we, 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 we get out, that's why we get out in that January time period. Um, and that's how we do it uh, with this spotting scope. Um, this is a, 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 a snapshot of what we have. Obviously, we do have nesting osprey uh, west of the William Floyd Parkway. Um, I'm not mapping them right now, and, and that's not part of the study. Mike and I have a, had a discussion and with some others about the feasibility of doing the whole island and using a phone app. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to uh, flesh out this year and maybe go live in 2020. Um, it's going to take some money, possibly. Um, just to point out, we do cover all the islands, fishers, plum, there's no nesting on either Gull Island, robins, which is in there, and uh, gardeners, I do have the, um, really through uh, folks like uh, Nature Conservancy and Mike Scheibel, we do have data. Uh, the family doesn't want us to share the data, and we respect their wishes. Uh, therefore, their, their information is not in, in my numbers. And hopefully in the future, we, we can add it to the numbers and we can get a better sense of what's going on over there. I would say, though, it, it's, it's around the neighborhood of 60 to 70 nests. It's not the, the population that it once was um, back uh, at the turn of the century. You, by the way, you can go on our website and see that map and, and click on individual nest sites and get the, the, the green, by the way, is um, active sites and uh, yellow are the damaged and the red, we didn't have data at the time or the data is not matching what it should be or what it most likely is. We had a 50% increase in tree nesting in Southwell. These are some, some kind of cool things, kind of highlights. Uh, that's interesting. That's where they used to nest, okay? Uh, you know, back uh, pre-colonial days, there were osprey, and then they didn't have nest platforms, so they nested uh, in trees uh, and on rocks and in some cases on the ground. 50% increase on utility poles in Southampton. That's where the PSENG connection really comes in handy. Um, we also had a lot of increase uh, on uh, telecommunication towers. So I've driven around uh, myself, uh, volunteers, staff. We know where all the telecom towers are. I think they're somewhere in the neighborhood of 50, and half of them are being utilized by Osprey. In some cases, more than one nest. Chimneys in Southampton Village, I don't know. It, it's, it's weird. It, you drive around some of these areas, these beautiful homes, and it's looks like a wood stork has built a nest on these chimneys. Um, there's, there's, it looks like... It, 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 Possibly one got away from us. We weren't watching that they were nesting there. Uh, most cases, a homeowner will call someone like Dell and say, hey, can you remove this nest in the off season? And uh, in this case, one, when I say one got away, young were born. And in many cases, birds are impressionable. If you're born on a utility pole, when it's time for you to breed, you're thinking, all right, I must go on a utility pole and build a nest. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that, but that's... You know, some of this is, a, is somewhat of a learned behavior. That is debatable. You know, that, that behavior is, uh, or that, uh, the, the, um, that, follow, that logic is, is debatable. I'm not saying that's what's happening, but why are we only seeing them nest in Southampton Village? There are a few in Noyak. Um, here's actually one that I took a picture of back in, this is in Mattituck. And, um, you yeah, that's the one we relocated from a home in Southampton Village. Um, and even though I, and I don't know if I mentioned this, we did a nest uh, moratorium on building new nests, um, fixing existing poles and, and working with homeowners and, and, and civic associations and, and home associations on relocating nuisance ones. Nuisance nests has been very important. We've continued doing that. Go around the forks real quick. Riverhead, so again, five East End towns, Riverhead, South Hold, Shelter Island, East Hampton and South Hampton. These are some of the uh, highlights. Riverhead, only 19 sites, uh, mainly because the available nesting sites, there's not a lot of uh, Riverhead on Peconic Bay. A lot of it is on uh, Long Island Sound. And due to prevailing winds, uh, nest sites usually don't hold up too well uh, on the Sound. So there's only 19, and only half of those uh, were, were occupied. 143 in Southhold on the North Fork. So, and that's half of, a little over half of the whole East End. And that, that could be attributed to all the little nooks and crannies and creeks in, in, that make up 
um, the North, uh, North Fork. Uh, it does not include Robbins Island. I didn't have all the Robbins Island data for 18, and it does not uh, include all of Plum Island. Uh, Plum Island has not only restricted the uh, uh, bird monitoring by Audubon, but they've also not shared any of the data from their scientists. It could be that lawsuit we have against the federal government, I'm not, <laughs> not sure. Um, Shelter Island, 80% uh, occupancy. So this is, it's kind of like the, the hotels and B&Bs over there. A pretty high uh, occupancy, five-year average is 69%. On, uh, on the whole East End. So you can see a lot more going on at Shelter Island. Um, Shelter Island too, it, it, it's its own little nation. It really is cool and their they're, they're nests that are popping up. I got a call from, uh, from uh, a supporter who said, you know, I know the Osprey are gonna be back. Can you, can you fix, fix our nest? It looks like part of the platform is busted. And I said, oh yeah, let me, let me pull it up on the map. And we didn't even have it on our map. Uh, and I looked at Mike Scheibel, uh, data, who's been monitoring Meshamek and, and, and Shelter Island for the past, I don't know how long, uh, the, at least the last 10 years, probably longer, and it wasn't on his, his list either. So th that's one, and, that, and in the poll had been there at least 10 years. East Hampton, this is an interesting one, 1.58 productivity, whereas the average is 1.38 across the, the uh, um, East End. And it does not include gardeners. With gardeners, it might go down a little bit, um, but we're not quite sure. Um, but that's a very high productivity. And, and one of the fastest areas they were, were, they were increasing was Akabana Harbor. And any of the, the, uh, the Bonnikers here, I know Mike and Anita know this, a bald eagle has taken residence, a pair have taken residence on Wood, Woodtick Island. Again, there, there's your eagleizer. Um, it will it'll be interesting, because wherever bald eagles nest, typically an osprey will, will, will avoid the area a little bit or give it a little bit of respect. We're seeing this in Watermill, where there's a, a bald eagle nest. It's been nesting for a few years now on private property in a, in a tree. And the, eagle, the osprey nest that's maybe 30 yards from it, gone. And uh, probably because the eagle pushed him right out. And in Southampton, our total sites have doubled and the activity has actually tripled. Okay, let's talk about the trash bird. Yep, trash bird, uh, it's pretty simple. Why do they pick up this garbage? Well, I could tell you if we got in our time machine, we went back to 1640s before the colonial time. Um, they weren't picking up plastic bags, they weren't picking up rope, uh, they weren't picking up toothbrushes and dog toys. And the result is stuff like this, okay? I know, what a bummer. End of the day. But you can help. First of all, I'd like to applaud you all for coming today on a Saturday. Um, uh, you can come, you can join us. A few of you have already signed up to be our, our monitors. Uh, we're gonna have a training in April next month. We monitor between uh, May and July. We monitor the activity first, and then we, we start looking at the productivity. And then you could do stewardship. We're looking for carpenters, people who want to bring poles around, again, to, to fix existing sites. And we team up with all these guys. There's many other people we team up with, but these are the main four we, we work with on cleanups. And for further reading, you can take a picture of this. I'll leave it up for a second. Uh, I also have a copy at the table. Oh, and also you probably saw the osprey that uh, we had a volunteer made out of coastal debris that we've picked up in the last year. If that doesn't tell you, uh, you know, to, yeah pick up the debris or birds like osprey and fish and other things are going to be impacted. And we have time for questions? No? Out of time. Thank you.